So I'm going to talk about the uh, induction of germ cell from uh, mammalian pluripotent stem cells today. Uh, let me introduce about the germ cell a little bit. After uh, fertilization, uh, totipotent zygote uh, divide repeatedly and make the uh, uh, unique structure, uh, so-called blast cyst. Then, a uh, pluripotent cell in the blast cyst can produce more than 200 cell types to build our body. Although we have uh, many cell types, we can simply classify them into two cell types. One needs somatic cells, and the other is germ cells. A key difference here is, somatic cells cannot inherit their genetic information to the next generation. However, a germ cell, in particular, a primordial germ cell, so-called PGC, uh, specified from pluripotent cell, can make the uh, sperm and oocyte. And by fusing them, they can again make the totipotent zygotes. So obviously, uh, germline is quite a unique lineage to, uh, that transmits the genetic information eternally across the generations. And I want to emphasize that PGC specification is the uh, uh, first uh, crucial branch point where the pluripotent cell determine the cell fate, either somatic cell or germ cell fate. Uh, let me introduce a little bit about uh, a little bit more about the uh, germline development using mouse model. After implantation of blast cyst, blast cysts form this kind of structure, uh, so-called excellent structure, and pluripotent epiblast can differentiate into the primordial germ cell PGCs at the posterior site. Uh, now we have know a uh, lot, lot about the uh, signal required for the uh, PGC specification. In particular, wind and BMP are quite important for PGC specification. This is also clearly shown by uh, ex vivo culture of isolated epiblast. So uh, if you uh, culture isolated epiblast uh, in the presence of BMP and endogenous wind can induce the PGCs like this. After specification of PGC, PGC migrate toward gonad to mature into functional gametes like a sperm and oocyte. So recently, uh, we can even recapture the whole process using pluripotent stem cells like ESL or iPS cells. To induce the PGC, uh, firstly, we have to induce epiblast-like cells, so-called EPLC, which is highly similar to in vivo post-implantation epiblasts. Then, by stimulation of BMP signal, we can induce the uh, PGC-like cell, so-called PGCLC, which is highly similar to in vivo PGCs. The important thing is uh, they are functionally, uh, they can functionally produce the uh, gametes, which can contribute to production of viable offspring by transplantation into gonad or a co-culture with gonadal somatic cells. If this in vitro system, uh, so-called in vitro gametogenesis, is applicable to uh, other mammals, a broad application will be feasible, such as the preservation of endangered species, farm animal breeding, and even the human reproductive medicine. However, so far, uh, PGCLCs, which can have produced functional gametes, on, have only been reported in mice. So obviously, there is a, a huge gap between mouse model and other mammals. So to fill the gap uh, between these models, uh, these animals, uh, we have recently focused on uh, two models, rat and rabbit models. Uh, they are physiologically similar to uh, human than mice, and advantage to use them is uh, reproductive technology to functionally validate the in vitro cell is well established in these species. So in terms of the strategy, uh, we can simply uh, start to understand germline development in vivo, and then reconstitute the uh, process uh, by using the pluripotent stem cell in vitro. So today, I want to talk about two topics, mainly two topics. 
One is about rat, and the other is about rabbit. Uh, let me start with uh, rat's project uh, about the induction of functional PGCLCs from rat pluripotent stem cells. Uh, people may think that the rat is just a big uh, mouse, but I want to emphasize uh, transferring the technique or technology from mouse to rat is not always straightforward. A good example is uh, pluripotent stem cell research. You know, the uh, mouse uh, pluripotent ESL was established about 40 years ago by using a relatively simple culture condition using the serum and reef. However, somehow uh, this culture condition didn't work in the rat. So we have to wait more than 25 years to derive the rat uh, pluripotent ESLs. And actually the serum free 2i, uh, so-called 2i, uh, containing the two specific inhibitors culture system developed in mice can support the derivation and maintenance of rat pluripotent stem cells. And importantly, uh, when you establish the uh, pluripotent stem cells in human, which is uh, similar to uh, early stage, I mean pre-implantation epiblast stage uh, pluripotent stem cells, we have to also uh, use uh, similar uh, stringent culture condition developed in rat. So obviously, rat model can breach the mice with other mammals, including humans. So here, the uh, question is simple whether we can induce the functional PGCLC in rat, which was achieved in mouse about uh, 10 years ago. Uh, compared with mice, actually, uh, we, don't have, uh, uh, we don't have a lot of information about rat germline development. So first, uh, we investigate the uh, germline development in rat by using the reporter system. Uh, here, we, we focused on PRDM14, uh, which is specifically expressed in uh, PGCs and pluripotent cells. And obviously, this is uh, quite important for germline development in mice. So we newly generated PRD14 HCV Venus reporter rat. And as you can see, uh, PRD14 uh, HCV Venus nicely visualized the endogenous uh, rat PGCs in embryos. So by using this reporter, we analyzed the germline development in rat. Here is the expression pattern of PRD14 HCV Venus. As I said, the PRM14 HCV Venus uh, is highly expressed in pluripotent cells in the brassis. But after implantation, they lose the expression. And then at uh, embryonic day 8.5, we could see uh, HCV Venus signal at specifically in the specified PGCs. Then we can visualize migratory PGCs and gonadal PGC by using the reporter system. And we also confirmed the specific expression was uh, is a co specific expression uh, uh, by st immunostaining with the uh, another PGC marker TFAC2C. We focused on the PGC specification in the detail. As you can see, uh, posterior epiblast positive for uh, mesoderm marker Bracuri T. Uh, some of the cells start to express uh, PRM48 three Venus. And uh, the number of the PRM48 Venus positive cells gradually increasing during the development. So we concluded rat PGC specification is initiated around E8.0 to 8.25. So from the analysis of this reporter system, we concluded rat PGC development uh, delays one to two days by reflecting the different, uh, difference of gestation period between mouse and rat. Based on the information, we next try to induce the PGC-like cell from the uh, rat pluripotent ES cells. Uh, this project was mainly done by uh, Dr. Mami Oikawa, uh, who is an uh, ex-postdoc in my lab, and now she's an assistant professor in Tokyo University of Pharmacy and Life Sciences. So as I mentioned before, to induce the PGCLC, uh, firstly, we have to induce epiblast-like cells to acquire the competency for PGC fate. However, we noticed that uh, the protocol developed in mice somehow didn't work in rat. 
so that ESL do not as an ad ad adherent monorayer in APLC medium like in mice, unlike in mice. The reason why is, uh, pro is likely uh, rat ESL loosely attach on the feeders and ten uh, tend to uh, float in the medium. So instead of the monorayer culture, we made a uh, spheroid from the ES cells and culture them for two to three days to induce the rat APLC. And we found that uh, we could successfully induce rat APLC in this condition. As you can see, uh, rat APLC uh, loses the expression PRA 14H3 venous as in the post implantation epiblast and acquire the expression of uh, OTX2, uh, which is a post-implantation epiblast marker. And transcriptome of ESL and APLC clearly show the uh, APLC downregulate the uh, ex expression of uh, uh, marker uh, uh, highly expressed in the pre-implantation embryos and upregulate the post-implantation epiblast markers. So we concluded uh, rat APLC in spheroid is quite similar to in vivo post-implantation rat epiblast. Then we tried to induce the PGCLC by using uh, cytokines, including BMP4. Uh, here, we newly generated the NAS3 TDT reporter to visualize the uh, PGCLC induction. Because the prd 14 hc venous is highly expressed both in pluripotent cells and PGCs, so we cannot distinguish the PGC from uh, pluripotent cell in the prd 14 hc venous reporter. But in, the, in case of this reporter, obviously, uh, as we expected, ESL and APLC do not express any, uh, any reporter expressions. However, uh, after stimulation of BMP signal, we could see nano 3 uh, TD tomato positive cell in the spheroid. And nano 3 positive cell also express OCT4 and SOX2 uh, pluripotency and germ cell markers. And transcriptome of uh, ES cell, APLC to uh, PGCLC at day 3 uh, nicely uh, correlated with in vivo development from the epiblast to PGCs. And we found day 3 PGCLC is quite similar to in vivo early stage rat PGCs at e, uh, e 9.5 to 11.5. So next, uh, we performed a functional analysis of the induced PGCLC by transplantation into the uh, neonatal testis. As a recipient, we used the uh, PRM14 knockout rat because uh, PRD14 is apparently quite important for PGC development, and as in mice, and uh, PRD14 knockout rat completely lack the endogenous germ cells. So uh, this knockout can provide the ideal niche for the exogenous rat PGCLCs. And as a donor cells, uh, we use a new reporter to visualize the spermatogenesis uh, crossing GFP reporter. After uh, eight to 10 weeks after transplantation, we could see bright GFP signal in the testis. And GFP positive tubes contained all the spermatogenic cells, including the PNA rectin positive uh, haploid cell, like uh, sperm and round spermatids. And finally, we test the function of the, these haploid cells to see whether they can uh, contribute to production of offspring. So we performed the injection uh, of the, these sperm and spermatid into the unfertilized oocyte. And we found that uh, we could generate a viable offspring after fertilization. And then they can grow normally and fertile. Suggesting that rat ES cell derived PGCLC can produce the functional sperm to produce the uh, viable offspring. So uh, after 11 years success in uh, mice, we could finally successfully induce the functional rat PGCLC uh, last year. So now we have uh, two validated uh, NICE models. So I think the uh, use of two models allows us to investigate the conserved and divergent mechanism during the uh, germline development across the species. So now we have uh, this system. So we next asked whether we can capture the pluripotent state of the uh, in vivo rat epiblast or in vitro rat APLC 
as an expandable cell line, so-called epiblast stem cell, uh, so-called EPSC. Actually, there are two types of pluripotent cell, naive pluripotent cell and primed pluripotent cells. Naive pluripotent cell represent the uh, in vivo pre-implantation uh, epiblast or in vitro uh, naive pluripotent ES cells. And on the other hand, a primed pluripotent cell represent the post-implantation epiblast or uh, epiblast-derived stem cell epistem cells. There are a common features such as expression of the pluripotency factor like OCT4 uh, SOX2 nanog, and they can differentiate into three germ layer in vitro or in vivo by a teratoma formation. However, there are some differences. For example, Signaling and downstream target or downstream uh, gene regulatory network to maintain the uh, undifferentiated states are different. And functionally, uh, naive ES cells can uh, form the chimera after injection into prosthesis, but epistem cell cannot uh, form chimera after injection into prosthesis. Uh, this is likely due to the difference of the developmental stage. And, uh, these uh, two pluripotent states are interchangeable. For example, ES cell can differentiate into the epistem cell, and epistem cell can reprogram to the epi uh, uh, ES cell uh, over expression of transcription factors. The interesting thing is, so far, in mammals except for mice and rats, uh, PGCLC can be induced from primed pluripotent stem cells. So the question is, whether we can derive the uh, rat epistem cells. And uh, the simple question is, what is the optimal condition for rat epistem cells? Actually, previous reports show the uh, derivation of rat epistem cells, but uh, it has not been well studied so far compared with mouse epistem cells. And the second question is, what is the feature of rat epistem cells? And our uh, uh, interest is whether we can uh, whether rat epistem cells are competent to produce the functional PGCLCs. In mice, actually, there are some controversial results of germline competency in epistem cells, and uh, obviously no report validates the function of epistem cell-derived PGCLC. So we address this question. Uh, this project was uh, done by, uh, mainly done by Dr. Kenyu Iwatsuki, uh, who is an ex a PhD student, and currently he is a postdoc in my lab. So he optimized the culture condition of rat epistem cell by using the epi, uh, rat EPLC from the ES cells or in vivo rat epiblast. And he defined the culture condition like here. And defined the condition can efficiently derive the uh, rat epistem cell from in vivo epiblast. And uh, uh, the, this culture condition can uh, uh, culture them as a uh, uniform undifferentiated state. Among the culture condition, for example, uh, lock inhibitor Y27632 uh, uh, is necessary for survival. So obviously, uh, if you remove the lock inhibitor, uh, soon after they collapse the uh, colonies. This is interesting because uh, uh, normally a primed pluripotent cell also requires rock inhibition, but uh, transiently just after one day after the uh, single cell dissociation. But somehow in rat, uh, rock inhibition is continuously necessary for survival. So the rat epistem cell might be more fragile than the other mammals epistem, uh, primed pluripotent stem cells. In addition to rock inhibition, we also uh, need to inhibit the wind signal to uh, suppress the, uh, prevent the spontaneous differentiation. So adding the uh, either uh, XAB or IWP2 dose dependently suppress the spontaneous differentiation colored by red. And we also found the combination of two wind inhibition uh, almost completely broke the spontaneous differentiation. So we next characterize the rat epistem cell under our defined conditions. The transcription clearly showed a rat epistem cell clear, uh, highly express primed pluripotency marker, but not naive pluripotency marker compared with uh, rat ES cells. 
where they, uh, they share the core pluripotency marker expression. And functionally, blood epistem cell can differentiate into the three germ layer by, by a terraformer formation. However, uh, they cannot uh, form the chimera after injection into blastis. So uh, overall, uh, rat epistem cell under our, our defined condition show the feature of primed pluripotent state. So next, we asked uh, the relationship between rat ear cells and epistem cells. So we performed a reprogramming experiment from rat epistem cell to ear cells. Uh, here, we use the uh, prn 14 hcv Venus reporter because uh, this is active in ES cells, but not epistem cells. And we introduce six transcription factors which uh, can reprogram the epistem cell into uh, ES cell-like cell in mice. After introduction of six factors, we change the medium from the rat epistem cell medium to rat ES cell medium in the presence of doxycycline to induce the uh, rat ES cell like cells. Two days after induction, uh, we could see Venus positive colonies, and number and size of colonies are gradually increasing during the culture. And after passaging these uh, Venus positive cells, uh, we could uh, manage to culture the, uh, them as a, like a ES cells. So we call it ES cell like cells. Among the six factors, we found KRF4 is sufficient and essential for uh, APS-C reprogramming in rats. So actually, uh, any other uh, factors or any of the combination uh, without KRF4 cannot reprogram the uh, epistem cell, which is quite different from mouse study uh, because the mouse uh, can be reprogrammed with other factors. We also characterized the rat ESL like cell and transcriptome of rat ESL like cell is quite similar to rat ES cells rather than epistem cell. And functionally, they can, uh, they can form the chimera after injection into blastis. And uh, germline information is also confirmed in the chimera. So in conclusion, uh, KRF4 is a key transmission regulator in reprogramming of the uh, rat epistem cell to ESL like cells and uh, generate, uh, reprogrammed the ES cell like cell is functionally uh, similar to uh, naive rat ES cells. Then finally, we asked whether the uh, rat epistem cell can produce the functional PGCLCs. So as a control, we use the rat APLCs. And as I, as I showed before, uh, we can uh, efficiently induce the nano 3 positive rat, APLC, uh, AP, uh, rat PGCLCs at 10 to 30% efficiency. When we use the rat epistem cell derived from rat APLC or uh, in vivo epiblast, we confirmed we could also induce the rat PGCLC, nano 3 positive rat PGCLC at a similar efficiency with rat APLC. And transcriptome of induced PGCLCs are almost similar, although the uh, origin is different. And more importantly, the transplanted PGCLC can uh, complete the spermatogenesis in vivo, and the PGCLC derived uh, sperm can contribute to production of viable offspring. So we concluded rat epistem cell can produce the functional PGCLC almost equivalent to the uh, ES cell derived PGCLCs. To summarize it above, uh, we successfully induced the PGCLC from naive pluripotent rat pluripotent stem cells and also from the primed pluripotent uh, epistem cells. So we, we, we believe that two functionally validated methods are quite useful to investigate the pluripotency transition and PGC specification. So let me move on the second topic about rabbit embryos. Actually, uh, there is a huge gap between rodent and non-rodent animals. So before going to rabbit, uh, let me a little bit introduce about the uh, uh, difference in early embryo development between mouse and humans. As I showed at the beginning, uh, the totipotent zygote formed a unique structure, uh, so-called blast cysts. And morphology of the blast cysts is relatively similar between mouse and human, 
although the timing is literally uh, slightly different, likely due to the uh, reflecting the gestation period. And if we look at the fetal stage, actually the morphology of a fetus is relatively similar between mouse and human. However, interesting thing is early post implantation embryo next to the uh, blast, blast cyst stage, the morphology of the, uh, these structures are uh, largely different between mouse and human. So in mice, uh, inner cell mass form the uh, egg cylinder shaped three dimensional structure, uh, three dimensional pluripotent epiblast. And on the other hand, in human, ICM form the uh, two-dimensional flat disc-shaped pluripotent epiblast. And actually, not only human, uh, most of the other mammals, pro, uh, except for rodent, form the flat disc epiblast. And the, actually, this stage is quite important because uh, it, uh, as I said, the uh, pluripotent cell determine the cell fate toward uh, either the somatic cell or a germ cell. So PGC specification occurs at this stage. So uh, we have to analyze the human embryo, but obviously early post-implantation human embryos are quite inaccessible ethically and practically. So instead of the early embryos, we previously analyzed the uh, fetal stage PG human PGCs by purifying the uh, PGCs from the gonad, aborted fetus, of, gonad of ab aborted fetus. And we found the interesting difference between mouse and human in terms of the gene expression in PGCs. Actually, PGC express both pluripotency and germ cell genes. And in mice, for example, SOX2 is quite important for uh, maintenance for, for uh, mouse PGCs. So obviously, knockout of SOX2 uh, inhibits the, uh, the maintenance of the mouse PGCs. However, interestingly, the human PGC, in human PGC, SOX2 is almost absent. And instead, somehow, SOX17 is highly expressed in human PGCs. So these data suggest that the, uh, there are differences in mechanism on PGC specification between mouse and humans. So back to the early embryos, we have to analyze this kind of uh, early stage embryos. So instead of directly accessing these embryos, we have now uh, multiple ways to model early human embryo development. For example, uh, we can culture human embryo uh, longer than before. And we can also make the uh, embryo-like structure from pluripotent stem cells. And use of model animals, uh, which is relatively similar to human develop early human development, will be uh, quite useful. I will talk about it, uh, them uh, later. And also, uh, by using the PGCLC induction in human, can directly address whether, uh, what is the mechanism on the PGC specification in human. So let me introduce a little bit about the human PGCLC induction. So previously, uh, we established a protocol to induce the human PGCLC by using the uh, human ES cells. Uh, by a stepwise protocol, to induce the, uh, firstly induce the induction of the mesendodermal fate by activin and wind with very short term, and subsequent formation of aggregate in the presence of BMP4, we could successfully induce the human PGCLCs. And by using this uh, in vitro system, we have investigated the function of key transmission regulators for PGC fate. In mice, uh, three transcription factors are quite important for the uh, PGC specification, like uh, PRM14, uh, TFAP2C, and PRIMP1. And by using the in vitro system developed in human, we confirmed these three factors are also important for human PGC specification. We and others confirmed the... Uh, in addition to three factors, we found SOX17, which is highly expressed in human PGCs, is quite important for PGC specification in human, but not in mice. So knockout of SOX17 in human ESL uh, almost uh, completely abrogates the uh, human PGCLC induction. And we have also known that overexpression of these three factors 
uh, can induce the uh, mouse PGCLC without use of exogenous uh, BMP signal. In contrast, in human, we found two of the factors, including SOC17, can induce the PGCLC without use of uh, BMP signal. So obviously, load of the key transmission regulators in PGC specification is partially conserved, but uh, some of them are divergent between mouse and human. So the question is again, uh, how we can address the uh, human embryos? So as a model, some people use the monkey embryos to analyze the uh, PGC specification and subsequent development. For example, this study showed the uh, histology and transcriptional analysis uh, revealed the uh, presence of PGCs, specified PGCs at the uh, nascent amnion, but also uh, we could see uh, PGCs at the epiblast. We don't know the origin uh, yet, but uh, for example, uh, embryo culture of monkey embryo, uh, culture of monkey embryo might tell us the uh, origin of uh, primate PGCs. So this kind of uh, information is very useful to understand the human development. But obviously, the number of embryos and facility, uh, facilities to use the monkey is are uh, highly limited. So instead of the primate model, uh, we are looking for the other mammals. And uh, uh, firstly, we try to use a peak model. As you can see, peak also form this kind of uh, flat disc epiblast, like in human, although the extra embryonic tissue are quite different. So this is a peak embryos at 11, uh, embryonic day 11. So this is a quite large embryos. And if you look at the center, you can see the uh, flat disc epiblast here. An advantage to use the peak embryo is we can relatively easily correct the, these kind of embryos by flushing the uterus. So this is a picture of the uh, Professor Nagashima and Dr. Matsunari at the uh, Meiji University, and they kindly help us to provide the uh, big embryos. So uh, they are flushing the uterus, and we could see uh, isolated, uh, corrected embryos like this. And big embryos show the uh, flat disc epiblast. And at this time point, uh, we could see primitive streak formation as well as uh, specified PGCs at posterior epiblast. And important thing is, peak PGCs highly express SOC17, but not SOC2, which is quite similar to human. So I think the peak is a, a good model for analyzing the early embryo, uh, early PGC specification from the flat disc shaped epiblast. In addition to peak, we have also analyzed the rabbit embryos. The advantage to use the rabbit embryo is rabbit embryos has a short, much shorter gestation period and ra relatively large litter, like uh, six to five uh, liters per uh, pregnant rabbit. And as in the peak, uh, gastration precedes the implantation, so we can easily correct the embryos. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, reproductive technology is well established in rabbit. So actually, the first successful embryo transfer was demonstrated by using rabbit embryo about 130 years ago. And as I mentioned, uh, we can easily access to the pre-implantation but gastrating embryos. So this is a picture of the uh, embryos. We can easily correct it, this kind of advanced stage embryo. And as you can see, uh, this is very developed from the uh, blast cyst. And obviously, there are flat disc epiblasts on top of the embryos. So by using this model, we analyzed the germline specification and subsequent development in rabbit. So firstly, uh, we try to, try to uh, trace the rabbit PGC specification and a subsequent development in rabbit embryos in vivo. And then uh, try to reconstitute the PGC specification process using pluripotent stem cells. A good thing, is, uh, good thing to use the uh, rabbit is we can directly compare between in vivo samples and in vitro samples. 
which is uh, really difficult in the primate samples. So uh, I'll show the uh, pre-implantation rabbit embryo development. This is a rabbit blood cyst. As I mentioned, the uh, morphology of rabbit blood cyst is relatively similar to mouse and humans. Then they can develop further and they form the flat disc epiblast like this. And obviously, epiblasts are positive for a pluripotency marker OCT4. And after that, they start the differentiation and they form the primitive streak and uh, form the mesoderm layer positive for Bracuri and T. Then uh, we carefully looked at uh, when the uh, rabbit PGCs are specified in the embryos. So we performed the immunostaining against the OCT4 and TFAP2C, which are the uh, PG, uh, germ cell markers. And we defined uh, OCT4 of TFAP2C double positive cells are uh, rabbit PGCs. <coughs> At E6 embryo, there are single positive cell because the TFAP2C is uh, also positive for trophectum, but there are no double positive cells in the embryos. However, at E6.5 to 6.75, we could see some double positive cells at the posterior end of the uh, epiblasts. And number of double positive, positive cells, positive cells are gradually increasing during the development. So we concluded rabbit VGCs are specified in the posterior epiblast at approximately at E6.5 to 6.75. So next, we carefully looked at the uh, transcriptome of specified PGCs. To do this, we performed a single-cell RNA-seq analysis. We collected the E6, E7, and E7 posterior epiblast and uh, CKIT-positive presumable PGCs for the single-cell RNA-seq analysis. And PCA of single-cell RNA-seq analysis clearly showed trajectory from pluripotent epiblast toward castration or PGC specification. And PGC population uh, highly express early PGC markers such as PRDM1, TFAP2C, and NANO3, as well as SOC17. And when we look at the uh, SOC17 expression at the PGCs at gonadal stage, we could see a uh, rabbit PGC highly express SOC17 but not SOX2, which is quite similar to human and pig. And next, uh, we also trace the uh, rabbit PGC development at migratory and gonadal stage. So at uh, 11, uh, e embryonic day 11 to uh, 12, they are migrating toward the gonad. And at the gonad, uh, from 16 to 20, uh, 20 uh, they are uh, expanding in the gonad. So from the analysis of uh, in vivo rabbit embryos, uh, we concluded rabbit VGC specification occurred around E6.5 to 7.5 uh, at the posterior epiblast with expression of SOC17 without SOC2 and uh, subsequent development. So next, uh, we try to reconstitute the PGC prof specification process in vitro using rabbit pluripotent stem cells. So actually, uh, little is known about the rabbit pluripotent stem cells. So firstly, we try to establish rabbit pluripotent stem cell from the embryos. So uh, we again optimize the culture condition to derive the rabbit pluripotent stem cells. And we define the culture condition, which is relatively similar to rat epistem cell on the culture condition. So from the E6 embryo, we isolated rabbit epiblast like this and harvested on feeders. And soon after, they can rapidly proliferate as a mono, uh, monolayers. And after passaging, they can subsequently culture as a, a rabbit pluripotent stem cells. So efficiency to derive this kind of cell line is quite high, about over uh, 80%. We could also manage to derive a uh, similar uh, cell line from the uh, blast cyst. We isolated ICM from, of, from the blast cyst and harvested on feeders. And although it takes a little bit longer than uh, 
this uh, time scale, uh, we could successfully in, uh, derive the rabbit fully potent stem cell line, almost similar to epigraph derived cell lines. And they show the uh, expression of pluripotency genes like uh, OCT4, SOX2, and NANOG. And obviously, they formed a teratoma uh, co containing three germ layers in vivo. Then we asked whether uh, our pluripotent stem cell is similar to in vivo epigrasts. So we used the uh, uh, data set of single cell RNA seq analysis of rabbit embryos. And we defined uh, each cell lineage by UMAP. Uh, here is the epiblast. Uh, this is primitive streak and mesoderm, and this is trophectum, and this is primitive endoderm. And by comparing uh, this data with in vitro uh, pluripotent stem cells, uh, we found uh, pluripotent stem cell, regardless of the origin, pluripotent stem cell in rabbit is quite similar to in vivo uh, rabbit epiblast. And we also performed a cross-species uh, comparison with a published monkey dataset. And we found rabbit pluripotent stem cells was also similar to monkey uh, post-implantation flat disk epiblast rather than pre-implantation epiblast. So we concluded rabbit pluripotent stem cells capture the feature of primed disk-shaped epiblast in vitro. Then, finally, uh, we tried to induce the PGCL seeds from the rabbit pluripotent stem cells. Like in, rabbit, uh, like in rat, uh, we used the nano reporter system, and we directly induced the PGCL seed from primed rabbit pluripotent stem cell, as in the rat pluripotent stem cell, rat epistem cells. And we could successfully induce the nano positive cells, and these nano positive cells also express uh, SOC17 and TFAP2C germ cell markers. So they are really uh, PGC like cells. And we can also perform the uh, comparative analysis of uh, with in vivo samples. So this is a result of UMAP of in vitro and in vivo samples. And we could see nice correlation between uh, induced uh, rabbit PGCLC with uh, in vivo rabbit PGCs. And on the other hand, uh, rabbit pluripotent stem cell is also similar to uh, rat ep rabbit epiplast. So by using the system, uh, we try to identify the key signals and transcription factors for rabbit PGC specification. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, obviously BMP and WINT are quite important for the PGC rabbit PGC specification, as in other mammals. And we also found, as in the human, so 17 is quite important for induction of rabbit PGC fate. So obviously, knockout of SOC17 almost completely broke the differentiation into rabbit PGCs. So this is a second summary. Uh, we found rabbit PGCs are specified at posterior epiblast of uh, rabbit embryos at E6.5 to E6.75. Uh, and interestingly, gene acceleration pattern of rabbit PGCs uh, for example, the SOX families is quite similar to non rodent uh, mammals. And by using the in vivo and in vitro system, uh, we can directly compare the uh, in vivo and in vitro samples to see whether they are, how similar they are. So uh, we haven't uh, tested the functional, uh, fu functional validation of rabbit pluripotent stem cell and PGCLCs, but uh, this is a, uh, uh, will be answered, uh, I can uh, answer in the future. So in summary, uh, we use the rat and rabbit models. And in rat, uh, we could successfully induce the uh, PGCLC, functional PGCLC, which can contribute to production uh, by our offspring from either ES cell or uh, epistem cells. So I think the uh, insight revealed from the functionally validated two rat model will truly lead to understanding of the conserved and divergent mechanism in the uh, PGC specification and subsequent development within rodent. And we also showed rabbit is an excellent model for mammalian development, especially uh, including uh, mammalian embryos forming the uh, bilaminar disc embryo like a human. And I'm also curious about uh, what is a common mechanism, how these pluripotent stem cells uh, maintain the germline competency so uh, these tools uh, 
can be used for the further investigation. So in conclusion, uh, insight from this animal model will contribute to the broad application of in vitro gametogenesis in the future. So I appreciate uh, all of the contributors, uh, particularly uh, Dr. Mami Oikawa and Dr. Iwatsuki in my lab, and my ex-mentor, uh, Dr. Hirabayashi and Professor Azim Surani. Thank you very much for your attention, and I've, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much. So all the really fundamental work on PGCs was done in the chick embryo. Um, a long time ago, I mean, when I was young. Um, and a lot of the markers that have been identified for PGCs in general and the location of PGCs and the migration of PGCs has all been done in the chick. And uh, as you know, the chick has a, uh, a disc-like uh, development. So have you thought about looking into something so uh, different as a chick where it's very easy to visualize everything? Uh, throughout development? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, the question is about the chick embryo, which is similar to uh, uh, rabbit or other flat disk uh, embryos. Uh, the answer is, I mean, a uh, kind of yes. I mean, the compare with uh, chick embryo is quite interesting. But uh, I think the chick embryo uh, PGC specification, uh, not specification, uh, PGC, uh, uh, PGC formation is uh, 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 formation is uh, uh, caused by the uh, inheritance of the uh, uh, germ plasm rather than induction of in, like, like uh, mammals. So I think the original, uh, original uh, fundamental uh, mechanism on the uh, induction or formation process of the PGC is slightly different between mammal, uh, from the mammals. So of, of, of course the uh, in terms of the structure, uh, quite useful, but the, uh, we have to also care about the uh, such differences. I noticed in your in your P, in your in your epiblast organoids that you had from rat or from from mouse, the PGCLCs always seem to concentrate in one area, and uh, I'm wondering if you know why that is. Is that do you see is is that dependent upon a primitive streak or is there some spatial something going on that's concentrating them in one spot because they're all exposed to the same environment. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, when we look at the uh, human PGC LC induction, uh, as you said, the uh, PGC uh, firstly observed the uh, multiple area, but uh, somehow uh, concentrated on some uh, specific area. I think the PGC might migrate during the uh, induction process and uh, gather together uh, uh, to uh, to be uh, mature further at the next step. So this is a kind of uh, tendency uh, in, during the induction protocol. Okay, there's a question that came in through the Zoom. Uh, were you able to produce live rabbits from PG-like cell-derived gametes? That is a good question, and uh, I would like to definitely want to do it, but uh, uh, right now, we don't have a good uh, model to accept, uh, uh, receive the uh, 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 induced PGCLC like a PRM14 knockout rat. So uh, if we can make the such germline-less rabbit, uh, we can transplant the in induced PGCLC into such, uh, into the such models to develop into the gametes. You, you show beautifully that you can introduce these PGCLCs into spermatogonia deficient testes. What about trying the opposite, getting them into female mm -hmm. that have no germ cells in their ovaries? Yeah, uh, actually, we haven't done yet the uh, that, that kind of experiment. One issue is uh, the in vitro maturation of rat embryo, uh, rat oocyte, is a bit challenging compared with mice. So if we successfully make the oocyte from the uh, immature oocyte from the PGCLC, we have to optimize uh, such culture condition to uh, mature into uh, metaphase to uh, uh, oocyte, which, is, uh, which can be used for the uh, in vitro fertilization or uh, uh, sperm injection. I've heard, maybe you've heard of this company called Conception Bio in uh, Berkeley. 
Uh, they claim that they're working on making oocytes from pluripotent stem cells. Um, maybe, yeah, they were established like a year ago. And um, just like on your diagrams, they're showing everything up to oocytes, um, you know, to, for reproductive purposes. Uh, so what, have you heard of it? And have you, can you comment on what does it take to do it in humans? Your question is about the uh, human uh, related to my our, our work. Yeah, well, what I'm saying is that there is a group, or, mm. right, a company that claims that it could be that they are doing it in humans. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering what's your take on uh, is it too ambitious to talk mm -hmm. about it now? Yeah, I think right now, uh, if we can successfully induce the human oocyte like cells. Uh, it's difficult to test whether it can uh, fertilize or uh, can develop further in, uh, to make a human itself. <laughs> but in case of the experimental animals, we can uh, opt optimize, uh, we can uh, test whether the, uh, they are really functional or not. So from this kind of basic studies, uh, we can apply these techniques to the human in the future. Can you cross transplant male derived PGL cells to female and vice versa and track them? Mm. Uh, that is an interesting point. Uh, we haven't done yet, but uh, uh, we have some observation uh, from the uh, chimeric, chimera embryos analysis. Actually, we, uh, we saw the chimera, uh, which has uh, uh, both male and female uh, cells. And if we look at the uh, Oocyte, uh, ovary or testis, we could see some immature germ cells from the different uh, sex. So they can uh, mature uh, at some point, but uh, cannot mature further to become a mature oocyte or sperm. That might be a related answer. Another question um, Do you think the PGCLC from mouse or rat? has full capacity to reconstitute a whole gonad in a similar way as the naive embryonic stem cell can complement in the tetraploid embryo. In other words, can they participate in tetraploid complementation? Uh, the question is about the uh, tetraploid complementation of the... Uh, or can it, can it really reconstitute the whole gonad mm. the way a naive ESL would? To reconstitute the whole gonad, I think uh, we have to also induce the gonadal somatic cell from the pluripotent stem cells. And uh, that, was, uh, that has been shown in mice, but not in rat. So uh, if we can successfully induce such kind of gonadal somatic cell from the rat naive pluripotent stem cell, uh, we can make such kind of uh, all pluripotent cell derived gonad. I guess uh, one of the questions that came through, I guess, is a more global philosophical question, mm -hmm. which is, uh, given what you've done, can you now make the connection between the kind of things that the zoo would be interested mm -hmm. in, in terms of preventing near extinct or resurrecting extinct animals, or even dealing with human infertility? Yes, I think this is a kind of uh, application uh, for the future. And of course, the Oliver uh, is trying to uh, induce the Rhino uh, PGCLC. And uh, uh, I think uh, we are using ex experimental models uh, which can analyze uh, in vivo uh, embryos uh, carefully. So uh, based on this kind of uh, very solid uh, information, uh, we can apply them to the uh, ex extinct uh, endangered species or human in the future. I'd like to just follow up on that a little bit. I think you've done a really uh, great job of talking about the uh, a repertoire of models um, and, the, but, and also the importance of being able to have functional assays. So um, you know, given the contributions that you've made and the development of this field, have you thought about you know, what would constitute a sufficient repertoire and are there other species where, um, where uh, the suite of, of necessary 
uh, attributes, including functional models, uh, might be able to be developed. And would this be, would this be, um, would, in, in your opinion, would this be valuable for extending the knowledge about convergent and divergent uh, aspects of early mammalian embryogenesis? Yeah. I think, as I emphasized, the functional assay is quite important to test whether the, uh, the in vitro cell uh, we made uh, really uh, similar to in vivo cells. So that, that is the reason why I choose the rabbit or uh, pig embryos, because the uh, reproductive technology are well established in these species. So uh, if we can uh, prove the uh, uh, we can, we can make the functionally validated in vitro cells, uh, which will be transferable as our mammals in the future. Would you expect uh, transgenerational epigenetic issues to rise from this technology? In other words, would something, could something in the pups move from an F1 into an F2? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that such transgenerational effect is quite important for the future applications. And we haven't checked carefully yet of the uh, F2 or uh, subsequent generations. So uh, once we made the, this kind of uh, uh, in vitro derived, uh, in vitro cell derived uh, pups, uh, we should uh, carefully assess the, these kind of transgenerational effect in the future. Great. I think with that, we will draw, uh, draw the session to our close. Thanks, everybody on Zoom. Thanks, everybody in the room. And thank you, Toshi and, and Ali. And we'll see you next month for the August installment of the Southern California Stem Cell Consortium. Thank you. Thank you very much.